Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have ransomed me, O Lord, God of truth. Psalm 31.5 Welcome to the Into Your Hand podcast with Brendan and Wesley. Today we are discussing the Sabbath School Bible Study for January 23rd, 2021. This quarter is entitled Isaiah. This week's lesson is entitled The Hard Way. The memory verse this week is Isaiah 8.17. And I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will even look eagerly for him. A special thank you to Fountain View Academy for giving us permission to share their music ministry with you. Links to Fountain View Academy are in the description. God bless you all. Suddenly it dawned upon me that this road I travel on is a pathway unreturning that my life will soon be gone. Yet even now as I'm held captive, Christ's name I only praise. These trials I'm facing last but few days. For I know fought a good fight, and I know that I've kept the faith, even though my destruction is at hand. I can sing because I see the truth has set me free, and I know I will live with him one day eternally. I am strengthened, my mind is free, I know I am heaven bound. For I know I fought a good fight, and I know I've kept the faith, even though my destruction is at hand. I can sing because I see the truth has set me free, and I know I will live with him one day eternally. When Jesus comes again, one bright and shining day, he'll take me by the hand, and I know I'll hear him say, Welcome home, my precious child. Welcome home, my beloved friend. Even though the darkness often seems too gray, I rejoice because you prove that you are strong and true. So come, enter in and live with me. Heavenly Father, we come before you to study your word and to learn more about you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. May the latter rain come upon us all. May we be used for you to share your love and truth. Guide us now. Forgive us of our sins. Lift us up. Keep us pure for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's nice to gather this evening. Our lesson this evening is called The Hard Way. And just to repeat our Bible verse, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 17. I will wait on the Lord who hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Waiting on the Lord and hoping for him. That's our hope as Adventists. 
we are looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ on that glorious day when sin is finally going to meet its end and the righteous in Christ will rise again, we will be reunited with our family and our friends, and we'll be taken into the clouds with Jesus to be with him in heaven. We start Sabbath's lesson with a story from New York City. Uh, There was a blind girl perched on the fourth floor window of a burning building, and the fire truck couldn't get in between the buildings to get the ladder up there to rescue her. They'd set up a net, and they were calling for her to jump, but she was too scared because she couldn't see the net below. She didn't know the people calling out to her, so she remained on that fourth floor window waiting until her father arrived and he called out jump he called and because she knew the sound of her father's voice she immediately jumped and was rescued she landed in the net and she was safe it's that same type of trust that our heavenly father wants to foster in us when he says go we should go when he says stop we should stop when he gives us directions and warnings We need to heed them because just like the father in the story who loved his four-year-old daughter, our heavenly father loves us tremendously more. So we're coming back to the story in Isaiah of a wayward king, a wayward king who had aligned himself with a pagan nation, with Assyria. And sometimes God leads gently. And at other times when we are way off the mark, it takes more of a roar and a flood. Let's take a look at Sunday's lesson. Do you have a Bible verse to share with us? The title of Sunday's lesson is Prophecy Fulfilled, Isaiah 7, 14 to 16. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. This passage brings up a very critical question that I'm not sure if we can answer distinctly or absolutely. And that simply is that this prophecy was given from the Lord to Isaiah to give to the king. And when Ahaz heard it, did he understand that this was a prophecy to be fulfilled in the distant future, or in the immediate present, or in both. The lesson says, so the people, including the Old Testament Emmanuel, whoever he was, and then it refers to Isaiah chapter 7, verses 14 and 15, would be forced to return to the diet of the nomads, Isaiah chapter 7, verses 21 and 22, But while they were poor, they would have enough on which to survive. So the lesson seems to understand that it was fulfilled in the day of Ahaz, as well as being a prophecy for the coming Messiah. So was this a dual fulfillment? Do we have any further evidence that this was a dual fulfillment, both in the time of Isaiah and then later when the Messiah was born? I think it does have a kind of dual meaning uh, because it's talking about that time period and the situation with the two kings. And it seems to be relevant to the two kings. But we don't have any reference to any child named Emmanuel in the Bible um, at any time. The only person in the Bible who's called Emmanuel is Jesus. I'm sure this is referring to Jesus. But we can also look at the word virgin. and Virgin can also have the word maiden, could be translated maiden. So it, it's possible that this has double meaning, and the one meaning is Jesus, and the other meaning is something at that, that day. The one text that seems to denote that it was fulfilled also in the, in the time of King Ahaz was chapter 7, verse 16, where it says, The land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. So that happened during the time of King Ahaz. The uh, Assyria was attacked, and then Israel was attacked by the Assyrian king that Ahaz had aligned himself with. So that would seem to denote that 
there was also another child called Emmanuel at that time. So it's possible that there was a dual fulfillment. It's just something interesting to consider, even though we don't have any further information about that time period. But we do know that that prophecy was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It was. Well, even if there's a child born at this time that fulfills this prophecy, the Bible doesn't even mention the person. Right. The story here gives some background. This prophecy of Isaiah about the kings was given in about 734 BC. In response to the bribe of Ahaz, Tiglath Pileser III did what he probably would have done anyway. He smashed the northern coalition, conquered the Galilee and Transjordanian regions of northern Israel, deported some of the population, and turned the territories into Assyrian provinces. The remainder of Israel was saved when Hosea, after murdering King Pekah, surrendered and paid tribute. A few years later, Tiglath Pileser conquered Damascus, the capital of Syria. So th- it talks about how this all happened very quickly. It says here, so by 732 BC, within about two years of Isaiah's prediction, Syria and Israel had been conclusively defeated. And it was all over for the two kings who had threatened Ahaz. So Ahaz making an alliance with Piglath Pileser III didn't give him any advantage because that king had his sights set on dominating that region in the first place. He was going to attack Syria. He was going to attack Israel and make them part of Assyria. And if Ahaz had repented of his paganism, which we'll read about later in this week's Sabbath school lesson, then God would have heard his prayers. He would have intervened on behalf of Judah and kept Judah safe from this overcoming and conquering king. On the bottom of Sunday's lesson, it says, think if you were living in the northern kingdom while all this was happening, how easy it would be to lose faith. What can we do to learn to keep our faith intact so that when tomorrow's calamities come, we can stay firm. It says to read 1 Peter 1, 13 to 25. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you address as Father the one who impatiently judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things, like silver or gold, from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last days for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. It's a very hopeful, motivational speech in First Peter that Christ has died for us. That we are valuable in his sight. He is interacting with us all the time. He is holy. We should be holy. We should be the obedient children and call him father. It's a very beautiful passage. If I was in the Northern Kingdom, you know, I'm being invaded and wiped out. Ephraim was no longer even a people about 65 years after this prophecy. 
And I think it would be very important to uh, flee to the south, to Judah, to the temple, and to worship the true God. Do you have any comments? Well, just that with the annihilation of the northern kingdom of Israel and the diaspora of Ephraim, of those children, into surrounding areas, they were assimilated into those cultures. So in the same way paganism had overtaken Judah, those people that did survive the attack, they just became like the people around them. So what is this kingdom of the remnant in which we claim right now? We are in a foreign land. And the secularism that is pervasive through the media, through culture, through politics, is trying every which way through satanic forces to assimilate the remnant. God is calling us to his side. He's calling us to faithfulness. He's calling us to ask for signs and for leading. And he's willing to give that. He's wanting his true people to stand up. But we are so embedded in this world around, and it's trying its best to assimilate us. So we need to be on our guard, as these people should have been, the people of Israel should have been, the people of Judah should have been, Ahaz should have been, but they weren't. So it's not a position of condemnation of the remnant, but it is a call to action for the remnant that I'm saying this right now. Where do you stand? Where does your family stand? Are they being assimilated? Because there's nothing loving and kind about uniting with evil. We need to be generous in heart, and we need to really reach out to those who we can have a positive influence upon with the Word of God and lead by example. Because if we preach it and we don't live it, who's going to believe us? But if we live it and we don't preach it, then on that final day, with tearful eyes, we'll look into the faces of many and they'll say, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't I have a chance? So we need to really think about that now, because if you've been paying attention to the news, we're in the end times. We're in the last days for sure. And and as you said, the, the news is looking more and more like Christ is coming every day. On to Monday's lesson, foreseen consequences, Isaiah 7, 17 to 25. The Lord will bring on you, on your people, and on your father's house such days as have never come since the day that Ephraim separated from Judah, the king of Assyria. In that day, the Lord will whistle for the fly that is in the remotest part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. They will all come and settle on the steep ravines, on the ledges of the cliffs, on all the thorn bushes, and and on all the watering places. In that day, the Lord will shave with a razor hired from regions beyond the Euphrates, that is, with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the legs, and it will also remove the beard. Now in that day, a man may keep alive a heifer and a pair of sheep, and because of the abundance of the milk produced, he will eat curds, for everyone that is left within the land will eat curds and honey. And it will come about in that day that every place where there used to be a thousand vines valued at a thousand shekels of silver will become briars and thorns. People will come there with bows and arrows because all the land will be briars and thorns. As for all the hills which used to be cultivated with the hoe, you will not go there for fear of briars and thorns but they will become a place for pasturing oxen and for sheep to trample. Thank you. There's also an excellent quote to start off Monday's lesson from Prophets and Kings. Invitation upon invitation was sent to erring Israel to return to their allegiance to Jehovah. Tender were the pleadings of the prophets as they stood before the people, earnestly exhorting to repentance and reformation. Their words bore fruit to the glory of God. And that's sort of what I was meaning when I was just talking about reaching those that are within our circle of influence. Can we be as the prophets? Can we be the echo of the messages that the prophets gave to Israel and Judah 
for those who are close to us and earnestly plead with them to come to repentance and reformation. We need the same thing in our lives, but once we have that, we also need to offer that to others. We need to talk with others. This great commission we sometimes think of in such an external sense of all the people that we don't know. But what about the people that are close to us? They're the ones who are more likely to listen to us because the pleadings of our words and the sentiment of our hearts is true because we love them dearly. So it's just something to think about there. But by turning God's freely offered deliverance away, Ahaz was guaranteed defeat. So like we were talking about, the king of Assyria already had his sights set on defeating Israel and Syria to become part of his empire. So the only thing that Ahaz did was guarantee the defeat of Judah in the future. He was the third one in line to be defeated, but he guaranteed that by staying away from God, by keeping his alliances with paganism, and by making an alliance with the pagan king. So Psalms 118 verse 9 says, It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. I often think of that verse when it comes to alliances in the political realm these days. How often do people look at the news and and see the polling stations and get excited about the next new face on the same old corruption? Why are we looking at men as saviors? We should not put our trust in princes of this world. We need to take refuge in the Lord. That is real security, and that is hope for the future. Because these princes of this world, these kings, these presidents, these leaders, they often go astray, and their desire for power is insatiable. So really hold on, because we're going to have a rough road ahead. It's not been easy thus far, but the alliances that we're seeing with the Vatican with the upcoming administration in the United States is fulfilling prophecy in a scary and powerful way. So no matter who you chose in the last election, lay aside that alliance and come to the Lord and hold strong to his word and stop looking for princes to save you. Do you have something to read from 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles? Uh, 2 Kings 16, 10 to 18. Now King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet Tegla-Pileser, king of Assyria, and saw the altar which was at Damascus. And the king sent to Urijah and saw the altar which was at Damascus. And the king Ahaz sent to Urijah, the priest, the pattern of the altar and its model according to all its workmanship. So Urijah, the priest, built an altar according to all that King Ahaz had sent from Damascus. Thus Urijah the priest made it before the coming of King Ahaz from Damascus. When the king came from Damascus, the king saw the altar. Then the king approached the altar and went up to it and burnt his burnt offering and his meal offering and poured his drink offering and sprinkled the blood of his peace offering on the altar. The bronze altar, which was before the Lord, he brought from the front of the house from between his altar and the house of the Lord, and he put it on the north side of his altar. Then King Ahaz commanded Urijah the priest, saying, Upon the great altar burn the morning burnt offering and the evening meal offering, and the king's burnt offering and his meal offering, with the burnt offering of all the people of the land and their meal offerings and their drink offerings, and sprinkle on it all the blood of the burnt offering and all the blood of the sacrifice. But the bronze altar shall be for me to inquire by. So Urijah the priest did according to all that King Ahaz commanded. Then King Ahaz cut off the borders of the stands and removed the laver from them. He also took down the sea from the bronze oxen, which were under it, and put it on a pavement of stone. The covered way for the Sabbath, which they had built in the house and the outer entry of the king, he removed from the house of the Lord because of the king of Assyria. Second Kings 16, we see that Ahaz sees this altar in Damascus, probably to Baal, some altar to Baal or somebody. And he tells the priest to <laughs> replace the altar that the Lord has and have all the people use the replica of the altar in Damascus 
for all their sacrifices. And then the the real altar, the one that Moses told everybody to use, the real altar that was there, was only to be used by the king to inquire of the Lord. Otherwise, he wasn't going to use it. If he never asked anything of the Lord, he would never use it. And it would just sit there un, unused. Second Chronicles 28, 22, 25. So Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, came against him and afflicted him instead of strengthening him. Although Ahaz took a portion out of the house of the Lord and out of the palace of the king and of the princes and gave it to the king of Assyria, it did not help him. Now in the time of his distress, this same king Ahaz became yet more unfaithful to the Lord, for he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus, which had defeated him, and said, because the gods of the kings of Amram help them, I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they became the downfall of him and all Israel. Moreover, when Ahaz gathered together the utensils of the house of the God, he cut the utensils of the house of God in pieces, and he closed the doors of the house of the Lord and made altars for himself in every corner of Jerusalem. In every city of Judah, he made high places to burn incense to other gods, and he provoked the Lord, the God of his fathers, to anger. Now the rest of his acts and all the ways from first to last, behold, they are written in the books of the kings of Judah and Israel. So ultimately, the king of Assyria goes to attack Ahaz. Gifts didn't help. And he closes the doors of the temple and has altars placed all over the place for the gods of Damascus and other deities. Clearly, God was not going to help him very much. We can see that Ahaz understood that the Lord existed and that the Lord was wise and understanding in that he maintained one altar as a means of communication with the Heavenly Father. And yet, in that same temple area, set up an altar to a pagan god. Not only did he understand that God existed and was powerful, but he also aligned himself with the pagan gods. So he was polytheistic, and then he drew the people into sacrifices to that pagan god within this mixed temple situation. I'm not sure how we could apply that to our church environment, but in our personal lives, we should not be a mixture of water and oil. We should not be a mixture of evil and righteousness. Those things that are not pure, we need to repent of those and sacrifice them on the true altar. We need to sacrifice those by placing them at the foot of the cross and leaving them behind. Because he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins if we do so, and to lead us on paths of righteousness for his honor and glory and for our well-being. But we can't be this mixed bag of doing what is right and doing what is wrong as Ahaz did with the temple service, and drew all of the people of Judah into the same type of idolatry. Our natural tendency is to trust in what we can see, feel, taste, and touch, the things of the world. Yet, as we know, the things of the world vanish. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. What is the text saying to us? How can we apply its message? to our own lives, and what difference will it make for us if we do? 2 Corinthians 4.18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. It is difficult, even myself this week. I had a really tough Monday, and at the end of Monday, I was like, praise the Lord. And then Tuesday and Wednesday, I was going through my routine, and why wasn't I praising the Lord for Tuesday and Wednesday? (laughs) Sometimes it's easy to give in to mediocrity when there isn't an external pressure from the world that pushes us and urges us to come to the throne of grace, asking for intervention, asking for God to really make a difference in our lives. So often that is the case when we experience health problems. The more severe the health problem is, the more we are really on bended knee more often. Or if something happens financially in which we're in distress, we also come to the Lord desperate. 
Or if there's a family situation that our family's falling apart, we come falling before the Lord. But he wants us to pray without ceasing. He wants a prayer to always be on our mind and heart. He wants that interconnectedness day to day. So how can we foster that? I think a good way is to start with morning devotions and maybe take time in the middle of your day. Just go to a place in which it's quiet and come before the Lord again. Yeah, those are habits that we really need. It's something we need to do every day. We need to be praising the Lord. We need to be seeking him every day and developing that communication and that conversation with God and to listen to his voice. I want to have a far closer relationship with God than I do. Like you're saying, we only seek God when we are being pressured. And that's just a mistake. God is is for us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We need to have that prayer life. I, I definitely agree with that. A morning prayer, morning devotions, we need to all do that desperately. Yeah, when I think of devotions and someone who was so true to his faith, and visibly so, was Daniel, who who would open the window and pray without any reservation. I think that that's such faithfulness. And sometimes we think of habit as something that we do without thinking. Sometimes habit is thought of in that manner. But a good habit of faithfulness, something fostered in which you draw close to God and he is close to you, is a very positive thing. So we all have smartphones and apps. We can set timers. Uh, My dear wife has timers in which to do things in the home and personal things and artistic things now and then. And in like manner, maybe we could set a timer on our phone with a simple message. Remember to pray. And we just take a minute and pray again. Whatever's been happening in our day, we bring it before the Lord. We ask for his guidance, his intervention. We pray for those that we know are in need. We just spend a few minutes and we come before him once again. Let's take a look at Tuesday's lesson. It's called, What's in a Name? Isaiah 8, 1 to 10. Then the Lord said to me, take for yourself a large tablet and write on it in ordinary letters. Swift is the booty. Speedy is the prey, and I will take to myself faithful witnesses for testimony. Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son son of Jeberachiah. So I approached the prophetess, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. Then the Lord sent to me, name him Marishelahashbaz, for before the boy knows how to cry out, my father or my mother, The wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. Again, the Lord spoke to me further, saying, Inasmuch as these people have rejected the gentle flowing waters of Shiloh and rejoiced in Rezin and the son of Remilia, now therefore behold, the Lord is about to bring on them the strong and abundant waters of the Euphrates, even the king of Assyria in all his glory, and it will rise up over all its channels and go over all its banks. Then it will sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass through. It will reach even to the neck and the spread of its wings will fill the breath of your land, O Emmanuel. Be broken, O peoples, and be shattered and give ear all remote places of the earth. Gird yourself, yet be shattered. Gird yourselves, yet be shattered. Devise a plan, but it will be thwarted. State a proposal, but it will not stand, for God is with us. So that name, Mahir Shalal Hashbaz, means swift is booty, speedy is prey. Mm. And we have an idiom in English that's very similar to that. Easy come, easy go. So in this case, it had to do with the kingdoms, right? And the kingdoms of Syria and Israel how they gained and how they lost, and then later of Judah. Since Judah did not listen to the gentle flowing waters of God's message of assurance, of protection, of calling for repentance, calling for reformation, the stream of Shiloh in Jerusalem, it became flooded. It became flooded like the great Euphrates River. So how can we apply that type of thing to our lives? If we remain in a place 
in which we're not listening to God's still small voice, are we not overcome in like manner? I I think that's right. So all that we now count as gain is all going to be lost if it's not placed in the service of our king. We're not blessed for selfish gain. We're blessed and given opportunity to live for the Lord. He's wanting a people that's truly devoted to him. He wanted Judah to be his. He wanted Israel to be his, but they had prostituted themselves to pagan deities. Do you think that that same type of alliance of nations can also apply today, Wesley? Beyond the personal realm, do you think that nations that align themselves with pagan practices are calling for God to reform them with a flood like the Euphrates River? I think so. And But the flood that they will experience is the second coming of Christ. There are final plagues that are coming upon this earth. Are the books of heaven closed by that time? I think there is a time when the books are sealed and the righteous will be righteous still and the wicked will be wicked still. But what I'm looking for is the Holy Spirit to come. When Christ is about to come, we shouldn't be looking for some manifestation going, oh, oh, look, that happened. Now I'm going to get my life right. We need to be looking first. I'm going to get my life right. Oh, maybe that's coming soon. Oh, it happened. I have to develop that relationship with Christ first. I think that the latter rain is a continual thing that we're experiencing as the Holy Spirit moves upon us. And the more we allow the Holy Spirit to work on us and through us, the more we see that manifest. It's not something coming in the future. It's you personally allowing the Holy Spirit to work in and through you. I've experienced in small ways the Holy Spirit speaking through me. And I at the at the end of something, I I can honestly say I I did not have those words. I did not know where those thoughts came from, but they were the right words at the right time and for the right situation in which people were touched. It had nothing to do with me except that I was willing. I had asked for the Holy Spirit to speak through me, and at the opportune time, the words came. Mm. So I think those are the types of moments that God really wants us to live in. Imagine it's not just, oh, it was four months ago I was preaching a sermon, and for these 10 minutes I could really feel that the Holy Spirit was speaking through me, and I saw the congregation visibly changed, touched by the words, Mm -hmm. and I was blown away by it. It's not just a testimony about four months ago, but it's every single day the words that you say are being spoken by the Holy Spirit through you because you have set your soul upon the altar. You have laid your life down at the foot of the cross. Your willingness to be open to his leading and speaking through you is continual. Mm -hmm. I think that's what Christ wants to foster in us. Yes. I think I think that's what was happening with the apostles. The last yeah. thing I wanted to say about that is uh, that when the latter rain does fall, many will not realize it has fallen. And, and that's, you know, scary. And looking, I think that goes along with what you're saying. I think that yeah, those looking behind do not see the flame ahead. Those Israelites that were in the wilderness that looked to the temple, they saw the pillar of cloud. They saw the pillar of fire at night. They knew where to go for sacrifice. They knew where forgiveness was. They knew where they lived. They knew where the temple was. They knew that God was there with them. They knew that he spoke on Mount Sinai. They knew that he wrote the law with his own finger on the tablets of stone. They knew Mm. his representative, Moses, who came down and his face shined with the glory of God because he had been up there with God. So those people who do not see the latter rain are not facing the temple of God. They're facing the other direction. And the times at which they deny the power of the Holy Spirit is simply because they have not engaged with the Holy Spirit and opened themselves to that gentle flowing stream of living water. Mm. So just as the land was taken over by a pagan king, 
so our souls can be as well. But in the inverse, the Lord would be faithful to the survivors of his people, to the people of Israel, to the people of Judah, and restore them to their land. So in like manner, let our souls be restored to the passion and the love of Jesus Christ and following him each day. At the bottom of Tuesday's lesson, it says, despite repeated mistakes on the part of his professed people, the Lord was still willing to save them. How can we take this principle and apply it to ourselves personally, especially when we fail and fall in our spiritual life? What pops to my mind is when I was a child growing up in the church and I had some moment of sin, I felt the shame and the humiliation of the sin. And it was difficult for me to pray about it. Satan led me into the sin. I was enticed into the sin. I had fallen. And now Satan is holding me down. Why would you pray now, you sinner? You know, this kind of thing. The shame uh, is like Adam and Eve running away from God in the Garden of Eden. At that point in my life, many years ago, it could take me five or six days before I would get on my knees and, and, and pray about what had happened or to try to rectify my relationship with God again. And I think this lesson all through this time period of the minor prophets and Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, this time, we see how desperate God was to save them and to correct where they were heading and their, their own destruction was up ahead. The lesson I get from this is, you know, as soon as you sin, get back to God. God is eager to listen to you. I agree and, with you. I think that, that that's exactly the place we need to be. We are warned in, in Hebrews that if we continue on willfully in sin, there remains no sacrifice. Right. But we are promised that if we fall to sin, it's not our habit. It's not our continual choice. We're not standing upon that sin in an arrogant manner, but we fall, we trip, we make a mistake, and we repent of that sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin, and the most beautiful part, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes. Let's take a look at Wednesday's lesson. Yes. The title is Nothing to Fear When We Fear God Himself, Isaiah 8, 11 to 15. For thus the Lord spoke to me with mighty power and instructed me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, You are not to say it is a conspiracy in regard to all that this people call a conspiracy, and you are not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it, for it is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy, and he shall be your fear, and he shall be your dread. Then he shall become a sanctuary, but to both the house of Israel, a stone to strike and a rock to stumble over, and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Many will stumble over them. Then they will fall and be broken. They will even be snared and caught. Wednesday's lesson is talking about the dynamic between loving God and fearing him. Do you have anything to say? Yeah, quite a few things to say on Wednesday, this lesson. There is an interesting interplay with the word fear and honor and respect and love. But one thing that we should always remember is that God is not to be taken lightly. He is very faithful to us and shows us his love and his compassion. He's gracious and merciful for a thousand generations, but he wants his people. He wants a faithful people to love him too. He doesn't want us to take him for granted. So in that sense, I think is a good way of understanding the fear of the Lord. Wednesday's lesson starts off with an interesting portion talking about Franklin Roosevelt and his inaugural address. It was told to a nation that was disheartened because of the Great Depression. And in a similar way, the U.S. and a lot of the world is going through a depression now because of the economic hardships of the lockdowns and whatnot. So what Roosevelt said was, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Was that true? It is true that we need to face difficulties with bravery. And if that's what he meant by that, to give courage to the people, 
Do not look at each day in the future with fear, petrified by it and not doing anything because of it, but to step out and to do what is right and to step forward and make the economy grow, in his case, as the leader of the nation. The greatest things that we should fear in ourselves are ignorance, indecision, and inaction Mm. away from the Holy Word and the Holy Spirit. Those are things to really be frightened of. Maybe I'd add one more, and that would be the grayscale of mediocrity and love unbound from the true nature that God intended. We hear so much about unity and loving each other and to set aside our differences. But so often the people who harp on those sweet words are really saying to set aside sin. And I don't mean set it aside like keep away from it. I mean, they intend for us to set aside the nature of sin and to keep engaging in it. Basically, I'm okay. You're okay. Whatever you want to do is fine. Whatever I want to do is fine. As long as we don't condemn each other, as long as we don't push each other for greatness in the sight of God, as long as we do not fear the Lord. That's really a mantra that we hear in this secular world. It's so pervasive now that if you stand up for what is right and righteous in the sight of God, you are considered one who is hating your brother or sister. But in actuality, by leading people to Christ, by showing the beautiful nature of the Word of God and the way to live rightly, we are loving our brothers and sisters in the truest fashion possible. By leading them to Christ, we are leading them to a salvation, to a life full of joy and eventually of peace. We have our struggles in this world, but if we really care for those who are led astray, it's not to side with them in unity of sin, but it's to condemn sin in a way that calls them out from it to the salvation that God supplies. I like the section in the second paragraph, fear God and give glory to him rather than fearing and giving glory to the earthly beast power described in Revelation 13. And we've got to really hold on now because I think we're at the precipice and we are dropping into a year ahead that's going to be very difficult for Christians to stay faithful if they align themselves with the princes of this world, if they are aligned with the beastly power. We really need to set ourselves in the hands of our loving God. We need to walk with him each day. We use the word fear in the Bible a lot. Isn't it oftentimes, isn't it better translated respect? Well, I definitely think that that is a heavy part of it. But I think it also, with that one word, uh, the full scope of its meaning in Hebrew, but an all-powerful God who is on the top of Mount Sinai and the mountain is shaking and smoke is billowing from it and the people are near it and he gives them warning, do not come near it because if you even come to this mountain, you'll die. He's warning them. He, he cares for them. So he's warning them, don't come over here. There's a level of fear there. They recognize that he is all powerful. And Moses is invited to the top of Sinai, and God reveals himself to him there. And he gives Moses the key for the people to live rightly. So I do agree that there is a definitely respect is tied together with fear, but also understanding the immensity of God and the power that he is, is also part of that. The lesson directs us to read. 1 John 2, 15. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. As Christians, we aren't to love the things of the world, the things people of the world themselves love. Thinking then along parallel lines as Christians, are there things the world fears that we as Christians shouldn't fear? If so, what are they? And why shouldn't we fear them at the same time? What things does the world not fear that we Christians should. It also tells us to look at Matthew 10, 28. Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him 
who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Jeremiah 10, verse 2 and 3. Thus says the Lord, do not learn the way of the nations, and do not be terrified by the signs of the heavens, although the nations are terrified by them, for the customs of the peoples are delusion, because it is wood cut from the forest, the work of the hands of a craftsman with a cutting tool. Obviously, we need to fear the Lord, and the world doesn't really fear the Lord. What else can we say about this, Brendan? Yeah, it's true that the world in general doesn't fear the Lord, even a colleague of mine in our office, and there are quite a few teachers in my office. They were having a conversation, and she said to the group, uh, she said, well, if I go to hell, at least I'm going to have fun. So there's no fear of the Lord there. There's no understanding of the end destruction, and there's no desire for that sweetness of the the gift of God of eternal salvation and to be with him. Is she also voicing a kind of God is not fun? Her view is that it's all of the people who indulge in every manner of debauchery, and you can live forever in like manner as compared to those who are in heaven and cannot or do not partake in those types of things that she reveres. So it's a fully twisted understanding of the nature of sin. Also, it's like not realizing that sin is a problem and which we should fear. We should really like, we should really understand that sin is a problem that we need to really seek deliverance from. Um, she sees God as restricting her freedom. Now, I don't think secular people see God as restricting freedoms. They just want to indulge in what they want to do. They don't. They have no regard for what God cares about. Only, oh, only someone who has a level of fear of the Lord would even think of God in a manner that He could restrict them. If you're completely secular and you uh, indulge in right. anything that your carnal mind can think of, He's not restricting you from anything. You do as you wish. Right. Sin is like a cancer that. You taste something sweet in your mouth for the first 10 minutes, and then for the next five years, it ravages your body into the most awful pain imaginable. Right. That's the nature of sin, and people haven't gotten to that point yet. So for them, they've indulged in whatever their particular flavor of sin is. They've tasted its temporal sweetness, and they haven't gotten to the point of self-destruction or they haven't seen how that has overflowed into the lives of those around them to destroy them as well. Mm, right. There's one other thing on Wednesday's lesson, and it said, if God is for you, and it brings to mind the text is, if God is for you, who can stand against you? Now, when you are together with God, almost everyone of a secular nature is against you, but the key word there is stand against you. Can they prevail against you if God is for you? And they will not, because God is faithful to his remnant. The remnant are few and true, and he will see us through. Let's move ahead to Thursday's lesson. Do you have a text right. to share with us? Thursday's lesson is entitled, Gloom of the Ungrateful Living Dead. Isaiah 8, 16 to 22. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will even look eagerly for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. When they say to you, consult the mediums and the spiritualists, who whisper and mutter, should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have not drawn. They will pass through the land hard-pressed and famished, and it will turn out that when they are hungry, they will be enraged and curse their king and their God as they face upward. Then. They will look at to the earth and behold distress and darkness 
the gloom of anguish, and they will be driven away into darkness. Those words are quite ominous, such as the title is as well. But we do know that Ahaz was deeply involved in pagan religion. We talked about earlier as he established the pagan altar within the area of the temple. And at the same time, he had the altar to God, just in case he needed to make a call. So we see the merger of paganism while at the same time trying to hold the hand of God. And God is not one to have a mixed fabric because it will tear apart. Mm. So we know that the people of Israel and the people of Judah were at various times involved in pagan religions. This often stemmed from intermarriage with the pagan people. They sacrificed to demons. The idol Molech, they sacrificed even their children. They were involved with witchcraft, with all types of rituals, all types of evil. So we read in 2 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 27, they did not bring him into the tombs of the kings of Israel. Why did they keep Ahaz out? Because he had aligned himself with pagan practices and drew the people into the same thing as well. So somebody or some group of people were a remnant even amongst Judah. And God always has a remnant. We look at Noah and his family when the entire world was corrupt and full of sin, yet Noah and his family were saved. They were the remnant. They were to keep the message that God was sending the Messiah to the world and would redeem the world. They were to keep that going. So also, we look at King Saul, who also consulted with a medium. In the lesson says, the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, son of Jesse. Moving ahead to Friday's lesson, there is a quote from the Great Controversy. Spiritualism, which numbers its converts by hundreds of thousands, yea, by millions, which has made its way into scientific circles, which has invaded churches and has found favor in legislative bodies and even in the courts of the kings. This mammoth deception is but a revival in a new disguise of the witchcraft condemned and prohibited of old. The paganism that we see promoted within secular society today is often harped on as personal decisions or as rights. It's even sometimes referred to as love. But make no mistake, the evil practices of this world are in alignment to Satan and his demons. God doesn't want us to have any part of this dark age, just as he didn't want Israel or Judah to be part of the pagan practices in that age. Looking at the summary of our lesson this week, through Isaiah's actions and family, as well as his words, God reinforced the message of warning and hope. The only safe course is to trust that God knows what he is doing. He has both the love and the power to guide, protect, and provide for those who let him. For those who turn to other powers, there is only gloom. We need to recognize this personally. We need to recognize this as a church. We need to recognize this in our nation. That if we align with Satan and his powers, the only thing left for us is destruction. But if we align ourselves with God, he will lead us on a straight and narrow way. And he will have what is best for us in his heart. And our lives will experience the glory of God. The grace will flow. So personally, commit yourselves each day. Take that phone that you keep so securely and make good use of it. Have it remind you to pray now and then throughout the day. Remember what the Lord has done for you. Keep those people that are within your circle of influence in your prayers and also in your lines of communication. Open yourself up to them. Reach out to them. Just because your family initially doesn't mean your family forever unless you keep those lines of communication open and you share your heart and your love with them. That's what makes true family, and that's what grows true faith. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we do not want to be as wayward King Ahaz or the nation of Judah that sacrificed to pagan idols. We do not want to be led astray in this modern dark age. 
we do not want to align ourselves with princes of ill intent. Heavenly Father, we want to be your children who truly follow you each day, who communicate with you and pray to you with sincerity of heart. Heavenly Father, give us the courage to reach those who are in our circle of influence. May we not be indecisive, but may we stand upon your word. May we not be inactive, but walk each day in the way. Heavenly Father, we ask you to act within our lives, to move within our church, and to transform our nations. Make us ready for your second coming and seal us by your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Suddenly it dawned upon me that this road I travel on is a pathway unreturning that my life will soon be gone. Yet even now, as I'm held captive, Christ's name I only praise. These trials I'm facing last but few days. For I know I fought a good fight, and I know that I've kept the faith, even though my destruction is at hand. I can sing because I see the truth has set me free, and I know I will live with him one day eternally. bound. I am strengthened, my mind is free, I know I am heaven bound. For I know I fought a good fight, and I know I've kept the faith, even though my destruction is at hand. I can sing because I see the truth has set me and I know I will live with him one day eternally. When Jesus comes again, one bright and shining day, he'll take me by the hand, and I know I'll hear him say, Welcome home, my precious child. Welcome home, my beloved friend. Even though the darkness often seems too gray, I rejoice because you prove that you are strong and true. So come, enter in and live with me. Thank you for listening. Please click the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Bible readings taken from the NASB are copyrighted by the Lachman Foundation.